years later. Uh, and it's been a wonderful partnership ever since. It has. Saban, I, I, I keep forgetting that you were you were in the first round of the competition. Yeah. Uh, so obviously you had an interest in this before Joe contacted you. What what appealed to you about this? Well, the words I wanted to play within the arena come to mind. Um, Teddy Roosevelt. Yep. Yeah. And the whole concept of playing it forward for me is very important to make art that is playing forward the tradition of figurative Italian Renaissance, Greco-Roman art. It's a phenomenal way of presenting us. Art is us. It represents us culturally. And personally, I don't want to be represented by cinder blocks on the floor. So I, I, I received a phone call in May, and um, I had never entered a contest in my life. I, I've worked privately. Um, all my work is, is with a client, the client says, well, we'd like to do this. The discussion is done. And I said, go to work, make a sculpture. It's quite a different process here. With, with, this, with this process, though, the visibility is enormous. It's global. So the message that I wish to carry forth um, with my work gets seen, and it gives an alternative to what's going on in the art world in a way that has great significance, not only for myself, but also for the people that see it. And I've come to realize, I've, I've been making art now for 35 years, that really, it's, you, don't, you don't make art for yourself in the studio. You make art for other people, for the interaction that you have with your audience. And that means that this is art in service of. And I think that's something that I, I really was searching for. And it's very important for artists to be accepted by community and society and not to be working like Robinson Crusoe out on an island by himself. So this is a perfect project for them. So this is this is the this is your your current concept of your composition. Well, all 75 feet of it. Uh, I think it might help if we sort of look at some some closer views. Uh, and if you read this top and then bottom, it reads left to right. Yeah. Uh, and and why don't you first of all, why do you think why do you think figure to form? Uh, is appropriate for a World War I memorial as opposed to other modes of there, there, expression? There several reasons. Um, World War I is called the Forgotten War, and it's my job to change that title. We don't want this to be a war that just disappeared. Um, it's a moment in history that changed the world, and it's, it, it, it's at the moment that World War I ends the way that people conceived of themselves in the universe, let's call it, changed. There was no longer a sense of God or divine order. Um, there, 22 million people died just in the war. I think 37 million died globally from other things as well. Uh, the idea of correctness or divinity or God, in parentheses, disappears, and you begin this new way of looking at ourselves, um, modernism begins. And then the way that the world is defined in terms of countries and monarchies, that this disappears. And America changes as well, going from an agrarian nation to an industrial superpower. I felt, how do you tell this story to everybody in a way that's not like abstract and conceptual, so that when people go see it, the memorial does what it's supposed to do. It's memorialize. It's supposed to make you remember the past. And hopefully then you don't repeat the past. You don't repeat the same mistakes. So I, being a figurative artist, it, for me, it's like, okay, I can show emotion. I can show movement. I can show drama through the figure. And people that are not into the arts will be interested because it's something that they can associate with because it's a portrayal of us. So, so take us through your work here. What what themes uh, are you trying to convey? What are you trying to evoke? Uh, and how are you trying to, to do those things? Well, um, I, I want to mention here that this was not me alone. This was a collaborative process 
with the commission specifically, Edwin. And um, the collaborative process led me through 12 iterations. This was not just done overnight. 12 iterations over nine months. And the reason being is because there's so many things that we had to cover and, and, and make it, like I was saying before, like a well-concentrated thing that when people would see it, they would have a visceral reaction. And we came up with a story that would be an allegory uh, and an emotional truth, let's call it, it's not historical, it's an emotional truth of what one soldier went through in his voyage from home front, battlefield, to returning home. And I felt that that was a really powerful way to exemplify the United States in a way that kind of like would give a sense of drama and emotion to World War I rather than it being something that happened only a hundred years ago. So we came up with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then with your help and advice and me going back to the studio or the lab, we came up with five scenes that told the story succinctly, which is um, the first scene being on uh, the my, my uh, right, which is the uh, daughter handing the father the helmet with the wife um, behind the, the husband. The next scene moves into the marriage where the wife's bids adieu to her husband, and then you have this uh, wrapping or intertwining of arms, and then the next scene after that is the husband moves forward um, with his comrades in arms. And each of these scenes moves at a different kinetic speed, and they all move towards the future. So then you get into the battle scene with the trench representing the... And that's in the lower left on yeah, the, the screen. That's right. The Atlantic Ocean, with the trench is the Atlantic Ocean, and you have a sense of this unity of soldiers. I, did, I think we did the, the battle scene over, what, like four or five times? Several. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I would, I would say, it is just like, really, for me, it's like, I'm, I'm not used to being criticized. You know, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> you want to you talk for a minute about your method? Yeah. Um, I think this is really relevant. Uh, I work with real people. Why? Because real people bring a part of the puzzle in the creative process to the table that I cannot do alone. And you're talking about working with models. Models, yeah. models, life models. So I went out and I did, oh, I did a, a bunch of searches and I went through 15 people, maybe 20 at, at the end of the day. And I came up with a group of, of, of young men and one uh, man who was a little bit older that actually brought a lot of energy to the story. One, one of these people had actually had a great um, grandfather that had died in World War One, and a great uncle that had come home from World War One, and with his service revolver had shot his wife and shot his um, daughter. And so he grew up in that home, and he came into my studio. And the way that I work is I have a, a platform and I have a light, a light like a stage, and it's a, it's elevated, so it's not ground level because art is about elevating. You don't want to look at it at the same level as you look at life, but you want to be looking up into the figure. And so we would we would pose um, the figures, and then from the I would use my cell phone and take pictures. And I took many, many, many pictures. Uh, like Twelve thousand. Yes. Twelve thousand. Twelve thousand pictures. So each scene had maybe I don't know fifteen to twenty five iterations. And then I'd go back to you, and we would have a discussion, and then I would doggedly drive back to New York and start over again. And I'm saying this because I couldn't have done this by myself. I needed to be criticized and kind of like pushed forward. And Edwin, Edwin brought something to the table that I, I did not bring to the table. He had a sense of what a memorial should look like. I had a sense of... Um, structure and design and how to make things fit. And then um, Joe and Phoebe also had ideas and it got clearer and sharper so that every single pose that we selected and picked tells a story. And it's, it's nothing is haphazard in terms of the posing 
um, and how they're organized and how they're knit. There's a giant X that runs through the composition. I don't know if you see it. It's right in the middle. Why? The X is a representation of change and transformation. And that's what this war did to the world in our country. And then as you move after the battle scene to the other side, you have a collection that moves upwards and finally ends with the father. Well, actually, I want to bring out one other point here. There's one figure in the whole composition that is looking directly out at you. And this was Edwin's ideas as well. Um, that one figure represents several things. It's the father, first and foremost. And then it's also America coming out from the war. And it's almost like a rebirth of a country. At the same time, also, it's the change in the world. It's a change from the way things were to this modern age. And then that father then ends at the very uh, um, final scene where he hands his daughter the helmet. And the helmet, to me, is the representation of World War I. That is the doughboy helmet. That's what everybody knows is World War I. And she, so she is the future generation. And she bookends, sorry, the relief. And here she is holding history in her hands. And she looks inside history, divining the future, which is what? World War II. And this, again, was one of the things that we kind of created together. And I, I felt this was really important because I think everybody would get this. School children, families, veterans would surely understand this. And it, it's... To me, this has to work on all levels of society to be understood by everybody. That's why you do the figure, because it you get it. You don't need a book to understand it. One of the challenges of, of this memorial is we're not building it for the veterans of the war. Right. Uh, the Vietnam Memorial is is a is a place of grieving. Uh, the the World War II Memorial is a place of a triumphant return as you think about the honor flights come to Washington, the veterans of that war, which was this very morally clear uh, war uh, that we brought to a definitive uh, victory. And so there is, a, there is a triumphalism that's appropriate for World War II. And neither grief nor triumphalism are really appropriate for a World War I memorial. And one thing uh, I like that you've accomplished here is in that last scene on the bottom right, there are two groups of soldiers sort of marching off stage, and the first looks back, to my mind, at what we accomplished yeah. in the war with, with pride uh, and somberness, but without, without jingoism, without triumph. Uh, because as we know, the end of the war, although victorious, was not really triumphal given what came 20 years later. And then the next group uh, is, is you, know, you talked about sort of handing off to the future, is really... America marching into the 20th, to, to the American century. Right. And, uh, and I think you accomplished both of those things here. Yeah. Well, I had it by.